Caroline. Well, good afternoon, everybody. It's been clearly a long day, but I hope it's a very, a very energizing and exciting day, as it has been for me to listen to all the different speakers. As Caroline said, my name is Carlos Del Rio, and I was born in Mexico, uh, where I grew up and went to medical school. And when I finished medical school 30 years ago, I thought I knew exactly what I wanted to do. I wanted to become a cardiologist, and I went to the United States for residency training. But I'm host to me, during that time, while that was happening, a viral infection from primates slowly made its way to humans. And then in humans started transmitted from human to human, primarily sexually, and started in Africa, and slowly started affecting millions of people in Africa. And we had no idea this was going on. This started in the 1950s and then 70s. But around the 1980s, uh, this disease made it to North America, and we recognized it. Probably was there since the 70s. We just didn't know it. We probably saw it and just didn't recognize it. But in 1981, a new disease was described. It's a disease affecting primarily young, previously healthy homosexual men, and it was causing very strange skin cancers, very strange pneumonias, and this was reported from San Francisco and Los Angeles. And I was starting my medical residency, and by the sheer luck of being in, in, in the United States at that point, I was starting in a city that is a home to the Center for Disease Control that was in charge of investigating the outbreak. And I was working in an inner city hospital that, uh, that was admitting patients with this disease. So short, shortly, I became interested in this, and I said, this is what I want to do the rest of my life. Well, what has happened since then? Well, AIDS has just become probably the most devastating public health problem of the last 30 years. Uh, as of recently as, 200, uh, as 2012, over 70 million people around the world have been infected, and over 30 million people have died of this disease. And even today, 35 million people are living with HIV, the great majority of them in sub-Saharan Africa, most of them in resource-poor countries. There's 2.3 million people newly infected every year. What that means is in the 15 minutes I'm going to be giving this lecture, about 100 people worldwide are getting infected with HIV. And there has been about 1.6 million deaths alone last year from this disease, despite all the advances that we made up to this day. So in the next minutes, what I want to do is not bore you with statistics or numbers, but what I want to do is tell you the four lessons that I have learned as being a physician taking care of patients, as being a public health specialist implementing programs, as being a researcher doing medical science, as being a politician having to deal with all the muddy waters around HIV that you have to deal with, and as being a friend of people who have been affected and affected and have died of this disease. The first lesson is that AIDS has been the most impressive scientific challenge of the century, and we've confronted it well. This virus infects the immune system, weakens the immune cells, so by the time we diagnose it, it's too late. The virus has integrated into the genome of the cell, and it's too late to cure the individual. You can control the infection, but you cannot cure it. But also, the virus has this incredible ability to evade the immune system. And by doing that, developing a vaccine has been an incredible challenge. And over and over, as recently as last month, uh, yet again, another vaccine ch uh, uh, trial has failed because we were not able to develop this. Uh, so the vaccine science has just, the virus has been too smart for us, has outsmarted us every time. But there have been scientific advances. And this has actually been recognized by the Nobel uh, Committee in 2008. Think about a virus just described in 1983, 84. By 2008, two people... Dr. Luc Montagnier and Dr. Uh, Francois Barre saint lucie were recognized with the Nobel Prize of Medicine and Physiology for discovering this virus. And in fact, it is the suffering that has made us, has been the strongest teacher of, for us. I think the suffering that we saw from HIV has really what has been the motor of what many of us have done. I mean, it's very hard to find somebody working on this that really has not suffered through this pain of this, of this disease. And, and I think the suffering has been, been our teacher. The second lesson is that while a virus is the cause of this disease, the real driver are the social issues. It's poverty, it's inequality, it's, it's food insecurity, it's gender, it's discrimination, it's a variety of social ills that have been here for centuries. Jonathan Mann said to me many times, he was the director of the United Nations Global Program in AIDS, and said, you want to find where, where there's disparities, you want to find where discrimination is, follow HIV, you're going to find it. And indeed, that has been the case. 
you can almost look at HIV income inequality worldwide. It correlates very well. Michael Marmon says, if the major determinants of health are social, so must be the remedies. So we have to improve all those social ills if we're going to confront this epidemic. There's no way just to think about this as a biomedical disease. To think that we're going to control it with a vaccine or with drugs, I think is simply not realizing what the consequences of this disease are. And one of those that we really have to confront right away is extreme poverty. Extreme poverty defined as people living in less than a dollar a day is prevalent around the world, and it should not be. We are making progress in, in bringing down extreme poverty, but there's a lot more that needs to be done. And I think all of us in this room have a role in doing that. Because in fact, we have been privileged to not been born in poverty. We have been privileged to be in a school like this or in other places and receive wonderful educations. And one of the most important things we can do to begin to confront poverty is actually to educate girls. We have to make sure that women education around the world is considered a priority. And we should never be ashamed of our tears. In AIDS, we have cried. We have cried because we have seen patients die. We have cried because we've seen extreme poverty. AIDS has made me more sensitive to these issues. I went into medicine thinking I was gonna be a physician. I have become an advocate for health, for social ills, for poverty as a consequence of HIV. The third lesson is around human rights. Again, it was when we discovered this close relationship between HIV, violation, HIV epidemic and human rights violations that we said, oh, HIV has to do with human rights. Well, the reality is, that most of the health problems around the world have to do with human rights. And we need to ensure that human rights are protected across the world if we're really going to improve health of our populations. Because in fact, as Dickens said, I was too cowardly to do what I knew was right. Well, we cannot be anymore. If we know human rights is the right thing to do, we have to do that. The fourth lesson is we can make a difference. We can defeat this disease. The end of AIDS can happen. We have the tools to do it. And when we have put it, gotten together as a global community, we've made a difference. After the United Nations summit on HIV, the world leaders got together and said, we need to do something about it. It is unconsciousable that people are dying from HIV in developing countries in Africa, and we're not doing anything about it. And under the leadership of people like President George Bush and others, Programs like PEPFAR, programs like the Global Fund were created. And today, more than 9 million people around the world are receiving life-saving antiviral medication. I was recently in Ethiopia. I go to Ethiopia a lot. And 10 years ago, I was, I was in a taxi in Ethiopia. And uh, going from the airport to uh, downtown Addis, you go through a street called Bole Road. And uh, I asked the taxi driver to impress me that there were funeral homes all, all over Bole Road. And I asked the taxi driver, why was it? And he said, because this is a flourishing business. So many people are dying of AIDS that if you want to make money, you make a funeral home. You make, you make caskets because you can actually make money doing that. Recently, when I was in Ethiopia, I was in a taxi again, and it struck me that a lot of the funeral homes had closed. So I asked the taxi drivers, I remember there were a lot of funerals home here. What happened to them? And he turned around, stopped the taxi, turned around and said, they've closed. Do you know about something called PEPFAR? Have you heard about it? He knew that because of PEPFAR, people were not dying. His cousins were not dying. His brother was not dying. And therefore, people were being kept alive. We closed the funeral homes. So this incredible effort that we've done as a global community in PEPFAR and the Global Fund has to continue because we have the resources. Think about the money that was put to bail out the banks. If we had put the same amount of money to bail out poverty and control this disease, we would have been done by now. So we are able to change. We've changed again and again and again. The US changed its global health policy because of HIV. Well, now we need to change for many other diseases. We cannot be stand still and say, this is our policy. We need to think how these things change us over and over and over. So as I conclude, I think my great expectation is that we will be able to defeat this disease. And it won't be my generation. It's going to be your generation. It's going to be the next generation that's going to do this. Because in fact, 
we're not going to be judged about how we confronted AIDS during the first 25 years or the first 30 years. We're going to be judged as, as a society as what we do in the next 30 years. That's going to be the answer, and it's good, really up to all of us. But as you do that, as you solve the riddle of HIV, and I have no doubt we're going to be able to solve it, as you do that, always base it on evidence. Ask the why questions. Implement the how pro uh, programs. Do not be afa afraid to fail. I just told you another vaccine trial failed. And guess what? More are being done. We're not turning around and saying, oh, we can't develop a vaccine. We, the scientists, are sitting down and saying, what do we need to do to develop a new vaccine? Learn from your failures. Every failed trial has something to show us. Because eventually, we will find the solution. But most importantly, have optimism. Be optimistic that you can solve the problems, no matter how big they look. And finally, remember that humor is important. You have to learn to laugh. You have to learn to laugh about yourself if you want others to take you seriously. Thank you very much.